For those of you who were here last week, and I think that's most of you, in these six sessions I'm trying to paint a picture. This picture of America during a nine year span, sometimes beyond, which were my formative years. <coughs> also formative years for our country. Last week we dealt with the twin specters of national, so national socialism and American apartheid as the third fighters in the ring, as 80,000 uh, fans witnessed perhaps the most politically charged boxing match in American history. Uh, millions uh, listened overseas, June 22, 1938, Yankee Stadium. Today, an upscale conservative Midwestern suburb reacts as the Nazi phenomenon developed in Europe in the mid-30s. Uh, begins to have a major impact on the Midwestern United States. I feel this affects I learned to cope through an extraordinary mentor. Alfred Bosch was a duck out of water, a lovable duck out of water, actually, but in many respects, Bosch was ahead of his time. He was uh, regarded by his teaching peers in an upscale suburb in Ohio in the 1940s as uh, something of anachronism. The 1930s, <coughs> he was an ardent new dealer. Uh, for a short time, he, that was tolerable, <coughs> even in an upscale Republican Midwestern suburb. As popular writers such as John, John Steinbeck uh, were appealing to the basic moral fiber of the populace in novels uh, such as uh, The Rapes of Wrath, films made from that novel. In the heart of the depression, the middle and even upper classes were, for the first time, perhaps the only time in our history, looking up to and empathizing with the blue collar uh, worker. Uh, but in the 1940s, during a time of war, rationing relative prosperity in the Rust Belt, uh, that brief interim in our cultural zeitgeist disappeared, quickly passed, and Foch was now thought of a li as a liberal socialist or socialist liberal. FDR could walk the fine line between the two, but most of the rest of the populace would not, especially uh, in the Rust Belt. So in our school system of the 1940s, Foch was increasingly regarded as a throwback to the Depression branded as an old socialist, and ultimately fate for sympathizers of Martin Dyes and eventually a Joe <coughs> neighborhood, and there were many in our neighborhood. How he survived in that school system, a terrible mystery. But his survival proved to be my good fortune, as I would learn through a bizarre sequence of events, uh, a sequence in which I was not only the beneficiary, but in which I would surprisingly be cast as the featured player, a sequence of events which I was to absorb in depth far beyond my young years, the reasons for the birth and the rise of National Socialism in Europe. At the same time, uncover the heretofore elusive reasons for those who can't survive. I first recalled Bosch as an occasional teacher in the elementary school. He would come to talk about something loosely denominated social studies. I've never fully understood what social studies are. Nothing very social about them. What I remember those very early years was his um, bald head, his rumpled clothes, and his rancid cigar breath, powerful enough to be sensed even in the back of the room. As he paced back and forth, hands behind his back uh, before the, in front of the blackboard. Times he would stop pacing and perch precariously on um, a pint-sized unoccupied desk in the front row as the little girls giggled on. These years of the late 30s, things were happening in the world, significant things. Bosch was talking about them, uh, but uh, far above our little heads at that time. He ramble on about rumblings in Europe, but most of all about the perils of fear and looking the other way as Hitler occupied the Rhineland and later the Sudetenland. I didn't consciously realize why. For some reason, even at that early age, what he was talking about resonated with me. I felt comfortable with Bosch, even though he was far over my head as well. Most of the kids simply felt that he was a strange, rumpled, sort of smelly old bald guy. They had no idea. They had no idea what he was talking about, and they could care less, and they snickered and counted the minutes on the Roman wall clock, Roman numeral wall clock, until this time period was over. Well, the administration felt the same way about Bosch. It didn't fit the mold, and they conveniently scheduled his class just before recess as kids' attention spans wane. On occasion, Bosch would mention a man by the name of Frederick L. Schumann, 
The name Frederick L. Schumann meant nothing to me except that I vaguely associated with the name of a classical composer. Of course, I was uh, mixing up Frederick Chopin and Robert Schumann. <laughs> Schumann, he mentioned, later became a full professor at Williams College. In time, Frederick L. Schumann's writing, together with Bosch's commentary, would have significant ramifications in my young life. Gradually, the region that boasts of resonating with me at this very, very early stage began to become clear. Remarkable how fast we grow up when circumstances warrant. As the late 30s wore on into the 40s, circumstances warrant. During those years, Europe had moved rapidly into chaos. My life in the Midwestern suburb of the United States was gradually becoming a microcosm of that far off box. How so? What would I learn of this from Schumann and from old Alfred Bosch? I not only learn that uh, from Schumann and Bosch, but the mesmerizing birth pangs of Nazism began in 1919, it was the year of Versailles, it was the year in which momentous decisions were being ground out in Paris by old men leaning over highly polished tables beneath priceless chandeliers in a palace pouring over, pouring over geopolitical maps and often rather arbitrarily changing them. They were doing so in a social swirl, it was glittering as the chandeliers. Elsa Maxwell gave her first party. Jean Cocteau read his works aloud. André Gide, <coughs> Marcel Proust at soirees. Handsome young, fully mobile assistant secretary of the Navy named Franklin Roosevelt uh, found Parisian widows far too attractive for his rather plain wife, Eleanor. Young gentlemen and ladies in formal attire danced away the night to the hot new sound of American jazz. But during that same year, 1919, and not that far away, something else was happening. It was happening around a broken down table, hardly antique, under a gas lamp, in the dingy back room of a seedy beer hall. It eventually deconstruct all that was hammered out. Uh, in that glamorous palace and lab labeled the Treaty of Versailles. For in that same year, 1919, psychotically disturbed drifter and failed artist, now a wounded veteran of World War I, living in the 2nd Infantry Regiment of Barracks, just outside of Munich, accepted an invitation on a whim to attend a party meeting in a Munich business. <coughs> when he gathered, when he arrived, related to Schumann, and he found that the so-called party consisted of four men sitting around a broken table under a lamp. The group leader was a muddle-headed uh, young locksmith named Anton Drexler, who had a loosely formed idea of synthesizing patriotism, unionism, socialism, and militarism. Young Adolf Hitler's reason told him to walk away from this group of nobodies. His emotion told him to stay. He stayed and joined, becoming member number seven. The number actually proved to be an exaggeration. He would later describe the meeting in Mein Kampf as the most fateful decision of my life. That decision would prove not only a fateful decision for the disturbed Hitler, but ultimately the death knell of that treaty of Versailles, and even more ominously, a death warrant for untold millions. This obscure, unheralded event in the back room of a Munich bar would significantly impact my own life as well. Twenty years later, that pathetic young group, ragtag group, now remained the National Socialist Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or NSDAP, for short, had not only conquered and subdued Germany, it had already conquered Poland, the Benelux countries, and most of France, and on May 24th that year, the foremost tank commander in Europe, Heinz Guderian, stood poised, less than a day's march out of Dunkirk, ready to wipe out the helpless British expeditionary force of 335,000 men. Guderian's former Panzer units had already crossed the north side of the AA Canal. All that stood between them and Dunkirk was a decimated, demoralized British corps, literally without uh, equipment and a few frazzled French units. Hitler's fa fa fateful decision to halt Guderian for five critical days at that point may well have saved Western civilization from immediate devastation. The tide would not turn decisively against the Third Reich for another five brutal, gruesome, costly years. So how then was I affected by this? On a Sunday afternoon that same May, as Guderian stood poised just outside of Dunkirk, I heard my father, ordinarily circumspect, 
about his speech, particularly around me, slam down the phone, almost breaking the fake light instrument in half, swear like a trooper. Those Nazi bastards just invited me to a Buddhist bonfire rally in the Scottsdale woods. They must have picked our name out of a phone book. <coughs> woods were just down the street from our house. We have a German name, it makes sense. Not the Nazi sympathizers all around us. They were out in the open. We were brazen, nothing was hidden. Franz Kuhn was so-called Fuhrer of the American Bund was staging rallies, 125,000 strong in Madison Square Garden. Charles Lindbergh was addressing America First rallies, 1,000 strong. People all around were listening intently and not critically in our area to Father Charles Coughlin. Henry Ford just proudly accepted a medal brimming with swastikas by order of the Fuhrer uh, from the German Council in Cleveland. Damn it, my father shouted. Menacing bastards are right here in our backyard. Next day, he came home from the office wearing a red, white, and blue pin that read, Save America, Aid the Allies. I couldn't understand why he needed a pin to say that. Didn't everybody feel that way? I soon learned. We lived on Linfield Road. It was the borderline between two elementary school districts, Lomond and Sussex. We could choose either one. We chose Lomond. No idea why. It might have been a coin flip. We were equidistant from both schools. But the next street over was Townley Road. That was in the Sussex School District. They had no choice. They had to attend Sussex, as you can imagine. This led to a not so friendly rival between the kids on the two streets. Well, why did we choose Lomont? Were we too good for Sussex? They formed the Townley Road gang. We were, of course, excluded. Shortly that, after that explosive phone call, a German exchange student named Kirk moved down to Townley Road. Six years older than I was, and about twice as large. Kurt turned out a member of the Hitler Youth. Inside of a week, under Kurt's leadership, I'd been surrounded by the Townley Road Gang, who didn't like us anyway, and beaten to a bloody pulp. So I first encountered with Nazism face to face, with the phenomenon of fear it generated. My father had an immediate answer. Within two days of that episode, he returned from the office with four pair of the largest and moldiest boxing gloves I'd ever seen. I remember they were red and white, and they smelled of putrefied leather. It was stopping the game to come out of them. I don't know where my father got them. He probably dug them out from a secondhand fire sale at a backwater gym down on Chester Street, but <clears throat> determined they were big so that nobody could get hurt. Immediately roped off a boxing ring in the field next to our house, between our house and Dickie Davis's house. Nightly thereafter, for the rest of the summer, Refereed boxing matches for every kid on Linfield Road, not town. I remember that first my buddies Jackie, Ro uh, J Jackie Powers and Bobby Powers came with Dickie Davis, but that now all the kids from our street, the school dividing line our side, began to come. I was soon complaining I was in almost every match. I realized now that circumstance was continued until I could take or take on at least comfortably any kid on the street. I'm surprised to this day that nobody's eyes were gouged out by the stuffing was coming out of those uh, uh, old gloves. But it was the Depression era. Gloves would just have to do. Bottom line is, I was never afraid of the Townley Road Gang again. In fact, Bobby and Jackie Powers and Dickie Davis and I formed the Linfield Road Gang. We were never attacked or even threatened by Kurt or the Townley Road Gang thereafter. They watched nightly boxing matches from across the way, but they were never allowed in. Later in life, I would often speculate if only Chamberlain, Halifax, and Lodier had reacted like my father had, fought back when Hitler marched into the Rhineland and unopposed 1936 or even later in Munich. Uh, if only they'd read Frederick L. Schumann, this compelling uh, um, narration of the rise of the Nazi dictatorship and his prescient warnings. 1936, against looking away and against paranoia. <coughs> how many millions, how many millions would still be alive? <coughs> when I reached high school, I found that the indestructible Alfred Boge had miraculously survived the system. It was still uh, reaching, teaching, reaching out for students, but this time in high school, I couldn't understand how, but I would soon learn. Since he was there, I gravitated to his classes. I would often stay after school for one-on-one -on -one bull sessions with both under his tutelage. And as I matured, I began to read the writings of Frederick L. Schumann. They were mesmerizing. The more I read, the more I found that I was able to engage in a meaningful dialogue with Albert Bosch, 
particularly on the diabolical rise of the National Socialist Movement, its counterparts, its parallels in the United States, those would that teach by asking provocative questions. So I passed into adolescence the entire continent across the country, including some of the most sophisticated societies in Europe. It's come to darkness. How did this happen? But Bush had an idea. In short, he said, they simply turned a blind eye at first, and then they succumbed to fear. Fear to dissent. That he emphasized always. Fear to dissent. Fear to question authority. Finally, fear of the very malady, National Socialism, they'd allowed benignly to fester in their midst. This book, The Nazi Dictatorship, following in short order by the publication of Europe on the Brink, Night Over Europe and the Zion for Power, Frederick L. Schumann detailed how the phenomenon of the Nazi behemoth began to take shape. The story read like a terrifying novel. Each step was a logical growth, outgrowth of what had passed before, agonizingly, at each step the movement could be snuffed out. Brutal suppression by Hitler of opposition, of dissent, often by mere bravado and then positions of authority, been the key to the survival and conquest. There, there had continued by Schumann. Every Wednesday, wrote Schumann, six or seven men met in a beer hall. Once a week, they would hold a discussion group in a larger place. Almost no one came. <clears throat> Only a handful of people even knew the existence of this pitiable party. Had no press, no funds, no organization, no leaders, almost no members. It was then that Hitler proposed that the party hold him a monthly mass meeting. He wrote out and distributed 80 invitations all by himself. First meeting attracted first seven members only. But the next uh, attracted the right, then 13, then 17, 23, 34. Then funds were collected. These <coughs> pitiful small as they were allowed Hitler to advertise the meetings in, in the Munchener Bela, uh, which Schumann described as a super, super patriotic newspaper with anti-Semitic leanings. Munich was a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Ocean spelled out for me what happened next in the quick sign test rods of the NSDAP. He painted descriptions so vivid, it was as if he'd been there in person. Had he been, I wondered? Had Bosch himself somehow witnessed the primitive birth pangs of the National Socialist monster? Did he, like journalist Conrad Hayden, witness its rise firsthand? He flee from it. Is that why he was here in the United States? He was a contemporary of Hitler, after all. He's German. I also learned much about Bosch later in a dramatic turn of events that would change my life forever. The personal history, this personal history I would never know. He would never speak of it. Well, the narrative went on. After the uh, organization of the first mass monthly meeting by Hitler continued Bozhek, Wayne Schumann, things began to move swiftly and his followers began to increase exponentially. 111 people came to the next meeting. In another beer hall, Hitler spoke and now for the first time began to discover that his voice, which at first seemed gruff and laughable, gradually came to have an hypnotic effect on me. The voice was harsh, staccato, and he hammered on themes that they could all relate to, the injustice of Versailles, dangers of Marxism, the wickedness of Jews. Munich was a great place to do that, hotbed of anti-Semitism. The crowd reacted, it always started slowly, quietly, voice almost <clears throat> He had learned by doing so for dramatic effect, he then modulate his voice, and as it rose in a steady crescendo, he build the crowd to a fever pitch. His listeners were frustrated with their law, so he told them what they wanted to hear. Appeal to their sense of injustice, patriotic fervor, most of all their fears. First, there was an occasional dissenting voice in the crowd. But soon, as his technique improved and the crowds grew larger, dissent was squelched as his more fanatic war comrades in the barracks began to act as bouncers. The mass meetings outgrew their meeting halls, mushrooming to 400 persons by the seventh public meeting. Comrades in Bolton now dealt brutally with the centers and hecklers. These same comrades would eventually don uniforms and become the infamous browsers. At this point in our dialogue, Bosch would pause. Look around you, he warned. Always watch, it's like back from the outset. Must be snuffed out as an embryo. Let it fester and breed. If you do, you're lost. I thought of my father, Tony Rodney. I was to learn this lesson from Bosch as well, but not just from books. Hitler 
was an uneducated man. He spoke the common German often making many grammatical errors. First educated Germans laughed. It's a mistake, said Bosch, as Hitler would prove to be a Faustian genius at symbolism. At a mass meeting over 2,000, in which Hitler boldly gambled all the meager resources of his fledgling group, laid out a party platform was an eclectic mix patriotic nationalism, socialism, racism, appeal to the emotion of the crowd, was greeted enthusiastically. Soon became the quintessential populist. He had learned that when he simply told an audience what he wanted to hear, whether it was true or false, was of no consequence. Look around you, said both. Do you know such politicians? I did. I still do. In the original edition of Mein Kampf, later to be revised, Hitler was to write cynically the following, quote, the German has not the slightest notion of how a people must be misled with adherence of the masses is sung. It mastered the technique of misleading. This line, of course, would magically disappear from later editions of Mein Kampf. Boston spelled out for me how Schumann, far ahead of his time in analyzing the anatomy of the dictatorial technique, had broken down Hitler's technique in only three basic categories. These can be described as Charisma, exclusivity, and advertising. Seems simple. Nothing seems complicated. First charisma, skill of spellbinding, of evoking collective emotional fre frenzy. Here wrote Schumann. Schumann. His voice from the platform, assisted perhaps by songs, images, banners, reaches out to the multitudes of litters. By a deft manipulation of word symbols and of muscular and gradual reactions, quote, it strips off acquired inhibitions, placed increasingly, caressingly, on the naked and elemental kid drives, with their aura of rationalizations and guilt feelings, and evokes a spiritual orgasm leading to whatever type of violent mass behavior the orator is seeking to produce. This is, of course, exactly the technique of the religious revivalist. End quote. These qualities are universal, said both. Easy to find, just look around you. Always look for the parallels. Spellbinders enjoy great popularity in the United States. Billy Sunday, Amy Semple McPherson, Huey Long, Robert Charles Coughlin, senior advocate Charles Tack Townsend, just to name a few, for our time. Spellbinders like Hitler appear to be a important storm to crowds, an island of safety in the midst of a crumbling political and economic structure. <coughs> Bush was quick to draw parallels to other leaders, but he significantly omitted Joseph Stalin. That parallel I shall learn much later by myself. But what then of the second technique, exclusivity, that of a secret society? Who among us has not at some time felt an urge to belong to some elite group? Schumann elaborated, these secret societies evoke solidarity for use of secret symbols, passwords, mysterious induction ceremonies. The initiated enjoy ego inflation by evoking deference through the use of symbols with which they identify themselves. Perhaps the most odious parallel in our own society, of course, was the Ku Klux Klan. Not only the Klan in the South during Reconstruction, but the revived Klan. In Indiana, in the Bible Belt, the 20s and 30s, Nazis were anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic, anti-Negro, xenophobic, so was the Klan. Nazis had brown shirts, stormtroopers, black shirts, SS. Klan had hooded night riders. Clan leaders had strange, often mystical names. Claxons, Grand Kliegel, Knights of the Golden Circle. Germany, there were Gauleiters. Both the Klan and Nazis had mystical symbols. There were any crosses in the United States, swastikas in Germany. So close were they, in fact, the two organizations once held joint rallies in the state of New Jersey. In pinpointing the parallels, both emphasized the intolerance of dissent, both groups. Pressure of dissent by violence were necessary. Lynching in the South was still a gruesome fact of everyday life during my high school years. But the mystique and the empowerment of exclusivity were certainly real keys. Advertising, the third and final technique which Schumann describes, seems harmless enough. First blush, Schumann would fill in the parallels to our own society, particularly with constant repetition to the point of numbness and the appeal of vanity, think of ads, social prestige, mother in law, eroticism, fears of sickness, death, economic insecurity. In the later 20s, 
mid-30s, Huey Long had fueled in his meteoric rise in Louisiana with the same sort of mass appeals, and with many of the same targets of scorn as had Hitler in Germany. <clears throat> Long had initially attacked the industrial monopolistic complex, Standard Oil, adopting the guise of a man, the people, rising up against the ruling classes. So it hit him. Both men were consummate actors and could alter their personalities like a chameleon changing colors to suit his environment. When Long gained power, he would align himself with the very classes he had denounced during his rise to power. They were useful to him. Hitler did the same thing. The key to advertising, of course, is broad spectrum appeal. Hitler proved diabolically adept at devising mass rallies, amusing, particularly Richard Wagner. The mass of show strength in numbers, carefully choreographed spectacles, endless marchers and banners as far as the eye could see. You may have seen the pictures of uh, the movies of Laurie Riefenstahl. The same themes to the point of numbness. All this was meticulously planned by Hitler himself, personally planned to stir the prideful Teutonic soul, at the same time bring thousands to a fever pitch of both excitement and submission, but there's something else. At the same time, all it was calculated to bring about intense feelings of mystical togetherness, something else. The feelings were tinged with the fear of being excluded, of being left alone on the outside. <coughs> mystical togetherness filled with a vast void for the class, and it filled, filled a vast void for the class uh, to whom Hitler most appealed at the outset, a class which he called the Klein Bergetron, or loosely translated the lower middle classes. Mostly white-collar persons whose livelihoods and self-esteem had been destroyed by the depression and by the monetary inflation of the early 30s, whose national pride had been dealt a death blow by Versailles, by the old men of Versailles. Bosch noted that they were people who felt alone, <coughs> felt as if they had, were being a left alone with no support system, abandoned, including <coughs> clerks, functionaries of all sorts, small shopkeepers, civil servants, a mainstay of the National Socialist Movement, were often persons uh, accustomed to being led, following commands, foregoing dissent. The genius of Huey Long, Warren Bosch, was in being able to meld just such a class into a formidable political coalition with blue-collar Cajuns in Louisiana. So how then was this upstart Hitler able to subvert one of the most enlightened cultures in Europe, a culture that had produced many of the world's greatest musicians, think of it, writers, doctors, physicists, philosophers, significant factor, according to Bosch and Schumann, was in part the failure of the conservatives, <coughs> and in England as well, the dissent. When Hitler assumed power and during his early years in office, we could have stuffed out. <coughs> in this regard, Schumann recognizes to boast that Hitler's disastrous beer hall, which in 1923 had taught Hitler a profound lesson, causing him to significantly lurch to the right to blunt just potential dis such potential dissent from the conservatives. While serving in Landsberg prison that year, 1923, he underwent an epiphany. At that point, the party had espoused socialist ideals, national socialist a German Workers' Party. The name implied it. Hitler had attacked industrialists as a monopolistic cabal, but the attack on the establishment hadn't worked. Now came the revelation, the epiphany. Well, why not use the industrialists and wealthy landowners as allies? They had the most to lose if the communists went out in Germany and Hitler's armed stormtroopers, well, they were poised to do battle on, on, on their behalf, but the feared communist militias, which at the time were gaining strength. There was this polarization. German at the time. Extreme right, extreme left. Another thing Bosch told me, watch out. When he released from Landsberg, Hitler ultimately aligned himself with industrials, Krupp, Tyson, others. <coughs> they proved to be uh, well, willing allies as the wealthy press baron, uh, the Rupert Murdoch of his time, a guy by the name of Alfred Hugenberg. His vast publishing empire became a vital cog in the rebuilding the popular image of the NSDAP. Later, Hearing a challenge to his autonomy, Hitler jettisoned Hugenberg in 1933 after he took power, uh, sworn in as chancellor. Hitler found willing sympathizers among the governing classes and the landed gentry in England as well in the early and mid 30s. He's included conservative party leaders such as Lord Halifax, David Lloyd George, who led England in the First World War. And for a while, even Chamberlain himself was elevated to prime minister in 1937. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor were fated by the, by the National Socialists on many occasions. 
Many of these conservatives in landed gentry feared a communist incursion far more than they feared Hitler. They viewed Hitler for all his crude fanaticisms and charisma, the first line of defense against the onslaught of Marxism and the communist hordes in the East. Many influential British politicians were thus lulled to sleep during the critical years of the early and mid-30s when Hitler could have stopped and stopped his tracks. As Lukács noted, uh, occasionally called, uh, Hitler occasionally called his British appeasers Meine Hugenberger, uh, my Hugenberg, and he was not entirely wrong. The American poet laureate in the year 2000, Stanley Kunis, grasped it all in a simple one-line poem. One line, titled The System, it goes like this, quote, that pack of scoundrels tumbling through the gate emerges as the order of state. The ragtag Nazi scoundrels that had now tumbled through the gates opened by their industrial leaders, now they emerged, emerged onto the chaotic and highly vulnerable political scene of Weimar. They were now free to unleash their untamed minions, their brown shirts and their black shirts. They created havoc and fear. They often offer themselves now as a way to overcome the climate of disorder that they themselves have created. Being in the center of the movement, Hannah Arendt would point out a marvelous work, which I commend to you, called The Origins of Totalitarianism. The leader can act as though he were a puppet. Bush now became incisive describing the legal facade that was now erected to bring Hitler to power. Once in power, Hitler could act as if he were above the uh, movement that brought him there. He had, in Stanley Tunis's concise terminology, emerged as the order of state. And he could now use that office to deconstruct the very political process that had brought him to that office. <coughs> so it was that on January 31, 1933, in its political deadlock, the conservatives did bring Hitler to power as chancellor, but in a coalition government that he did not control proved to be a fatal mistake. That lack of control would soon disappear, burning of the Reichstag one month later, on February 28, 1933. An aged and despondent President von Hindenburg, fearful of insurrection, was now persuaded to sign something called an emergency decree for the protection of the people in the state. Technically legal, using Article 48 of the German Constitution, proved to be a major step in Germany's rapid slide down the slippery slope to fascism. Emergency decree suspended all legal protection. Speech, assembly, property, personal liberty, in short, Bill of Rights was suspended, and the separation of powers was voided. Always beware of paranoia, said Bosch, leads to so-called emergency suspension of rights. Watch for parallels. There are eternal lessons to be learned here. Such suspensions are never temporary. For this opening, Hitler as chancellor now arrested a suspected terrorist, Communists and the stormtroopers burst into courtrooms, expelling Jewish lawyers, magistrates, sacked left wing offices and newspapers. A major crack in the German democratic dike had now been opened. It would, know, it would only widen further. This party now succeeded in passing an enabling act, empowering Hitler to govern by decree for four years, after which he promised to retire. Amazing thing happened. And after the Bundestag, after the emergency decree first, the von Hindenburg, it was an election. And Hitler's party still did not gain a majority. Nonetheless, they now needed a two-thirds majority. Yet this enabling act is basically the same thing, allowing him to govern by decree for four years. Passage of the act required that two-thirds majority. The opposition was already cowed in submission to the Bundestag. They were afraid to oppose it, fear to dissent, fearful of themselves being arrested as subversives. Then on March 24th, the Catholic Center Party, which consented with the consent of the Vatican, voted for the Enabling Act, as did the aged von Hindenburg's party. Shortly after that, the Enabling Decree passed. Hitler would sign a concord out of the Vatican shortly thereafter, uh, from a promising tolerance for Catholics, so long as the Vatican kept Catholics out of politics in Germany. All parties but one were now abolished. With this, all semblance of democracy in Germany was at an end. Conservatives who enabled this monster, who still felt they could control it, thereafter turned a blind eye to actions against Jews and Marxists, to the ominous beginnings of a concentration camp in a remote village called Dachau. 
black curtain had been drawn over Europe, a curtain would not be lifted, but untold millions would perish. Allies would ultimately liberate Germany 12 years later in 1945. It all been so logical, so sequential, so predictable, so agonizingly legal. Bosch following descriptions of Schumann walked me through each tortured step in this insidious slide into the gutter domino, warning me forever be on guard for parallels in our own society. At the time, I failed to perceive that mixed in among Schumann's brilliant dissection of the National Socialist Movement as accurate for a warning, war would precipitate were its great concerns about the state of the so-called proletariat. In the late 30s, Schumann began to propose that a proletarian revolt in Germany would be the only possible means of bringing down the NSDAP, which I'm certain seemed to him at the time the only possible solution. He lamented the fact that German socialists were insufficiently organized are motivated to effectuate such a revolt, long for the day when the working class would rise up against the mix of the so-called petit bourgeoisie and the ruling classes that underlay Hitler's real power. Schumann was writing, the House on American Activities Committee under the chairmanship of Southern Martin Dies now shifted its focus from Nazism to red baiting. Frederick Schumann became a target of that committee. And he would remain so throughout the war and beyond, notwithstanding the fact but while serving as an analyst at German radio uh, broadcast for the FCC during the war, he was attacked by that committee and exonerated, fully and totally exonerated. These are developments I never heard of or read about until much later in college. They were never the subject of my after-school dialogues with Bosch. The red-baiting atmosphere of the 30s had subsided somewhat following Pearl Harbor. Both circumstances propelled us onto the same side as the Soviet Union. As my high school years were coming to an end, relations between the victorious United States and Soviet Union were rapidly deteriorating. China was about to fall to Mao. Alger Hiss would soon be out. Truman, whose ratings were abysmal despite his re-election by a hair in 1947, had already adopted loyalty oaths in an attempt to counter the Republican soft on communism mantra. Insecurity was mounting here and would culminate before long in the throttling of his sin, which we all experienced in the McCarthy shame in the early 50s. In the midst of this atmosphere, the spreading red scare, I was preparing to apply to college, an upscale conservative suburb in the heart of the Midwest Rust Belt. Alfred Bosch appointed himself mentor-in-chief of my college application. A high school guidance counselor, who is not the swiftest tool in the academic shed, I think you may know some like that, and who hardly knew my name, had me pegged for the Adelbert, pegged for the Adelbert College at West Missouri University in downtown Cleveland, a credible uh, local educational institution. I was a kid, he was, a, he was an authority figure, I resigned myself to my pick, live at home, become a Western Reserve red cat. Most had other ideas decided that I ought to study under Frederick L. Schumann at Williams or under Carl Friedrich uh, at uh, Harvard. To me, this was a pipe dream. Guidance counselor would not approve an application to either institution. The principal, of course, could override him, but the chance of this happening were non-existent. It was a major obstacle to overcome, namely the principal himself. What about this principal? Buford H. Russell, principal of the high school, was also the very proud commander of the local American Legion post. It was a five foot two inch martinet, quite unlike the rumpled Alfred Bosch, Russell always appeared to have just stepped off a bandstand. Black hair was carefully plastered back with Kreml hair tonic. His suits were impeccably depressed. Black shoes were shined to a gloss in his initial white shirts. Well, they invariably sported Tony couplings and uh, neckties. Russell's intellectual interests ran the entire gamut from A to B. <laughs> All the way from varsity football to the uh, marching band at halftime. <laughs> Thousands of our educational tax dollars, no doubt, were spent on both. Russell was a professional football referee. He lived for Saturday afternoons in the fall when he and his five foot two inch frame could blow whistles and lord it over 300 pound scholastic gorillas. <laughs> Unfortunately, Russell's override, and his written recommendation was a prerequisite to my college application. He didn't even know who I was. 
were not on the varsity. I was not on the varsity football team. My parents had steadfastly refused to sign that, that consent form, the release form, which I resented terribly at the time, of which I am now eternally grateful. <laughs> so I confined my activity in that sphere to playing Sunday afternoon tackle football in the sandlots down on the Lake Erie. And not in the marching band, having squandered my meager musical talents in futile attempts to emulate Fats Waller at the keyboard and such culturally enriching compositions as Down the Road a Piece and Jelly Roll Morton's Boogie. It's more, Russell hardly knew Bosch, and Russell was not his best in composition anyway, at least not articulate enough to Bosch. Russell's failure to override the guidance counselor, or worse yet, his incoherent recommendation, either Williams or Harvard, would be an instant rejection. Our most recent high school graduating classes had meager accepted records of both schools what to do. Alfred Bosch was German. Well, his dress habits were bohemian. He was the quintessential Prussian in his meticulous attention to problem solving. So it was. In the late spring of 1947, just before the summer break, Bosch took me aside after class, advised me he was about to go to work on a plan. It's a plan to get Russell to both override the guidance counselor and send off a rave, in depth recommendation that reeked of the very understand, understanding of the very core of my being. Frankly, I didn't know I had such a thing as a core of my being. Besides, I was much too young to have a core. I was just a plain old garden variety, adolescent, surface being, as far as I knew. I thought that Bosch had clearly taken leave of his senses. Didn't he know that I was the prototypical anti-Russell? Russell knew nothing about me. Surely Bosch was embarked on a fool's errand. Bosch then rather, rather matter-of-factly explained to me that he was about to enter the hospital for a double hernia operation. Anticipated that his recuperation would be long and it would be slow. He was a slow healer, he assured me. And during that long hospital stay, he would have time to devise an attack strategy. I was flabbergasted. Was my mentor really about to chart an attack? I mean, hello? <laughs> I wrote it off as an illusion. Utopian dream, worn out old socialist war horse. The only glory I brought to high school was a rather undistinguished looking medal in an extemporaneous speech contest. Since it was just a medal and a trophy, it was not even in the trophy case that Russell would uh, view admiringly every morning on his way into the office. Besides, even if he couldn't catch his attention, uh, Bosch's, in Bosch's words, Buford had the attention span of a lightning bolt. <laughs> Buford Russell was a veteran. And apparently served in one sport capacity or another. Uh, no one dared ask, no one knew. But he was a very vocal supporter of the political figures who mouthed patriotic slogans among them, the very vocal leaders of the House Un American Activities Committee, HUAC. Also very popular among the members of the, uh, of the uh, District Board of Education, who were Buford's superiors. Now, Russell did not like, did not particularly dislike Frederick L. Schumann. It's only because he never heard of Frederick L. Schumann. Had Russell known of Schumann, said Bosch, the farthest thing from Russell's mind would have been to enable me or anyone else from our high school to go off and study with an Eastern establishment egghead liberal weenie suspected by Huack. Schumann had already acquired the nickname of Fred, and that would stick with him throughout the McCarthy period would follow him even into the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Given the circumstances, as Bosch emerged from the hospital, we began the fall semester, the chances of getting me past Russell, and off to study under Schumann and Williams or Friedrich and Harvard, uh, appeared slim to none. But through his word, my newly discovered Prussian mentor, Bosch, emerged from the hospital with a plan of attack. It proved to be a plan worthy of his Prussian hair. If Russell is the objective, vowed Bosch, we must attack him where he lives. November was fast approaching, and with it came the holiday then known as Armistice Day. Today we know it as Veterans Day. Fighting in the First World War had mercifully been brought to a halt in the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November 11th, 1918. On that day every year, Russell and his American Legion drinking buddies later in the day would be out selling little red poppies. Be caught without one in your lapel on November 11th was deemed unpatriotic. And veterans like Russell had no qualms whatsoever about letting you know uh, their patriotic feelings on the subject. They were the super patriots. 
The high school assembly honoring the war dead was an unpopular activity among the faculty. They would try desperately to dump their responsibility, and usually the least tenured person among them was railroaded into the job. Since the Armistice Day Assembly was a patriotic activity, however, it had become an untouchable on Russell's list of priorities. This year, Bosch stunned his colleagues by volunteering for the job. About two weeks before the event, I was to learn more. One day late in October, Bosch instructed him to remain after class. The classroom had empty and quietly shut the door, pulled a well-thumbed book out of an old green book bag. Here, he said, pointing to the poem. Sit down right now and read it. Memorize it. Learn to recite as if the rest of your life depended on it or remain. <clears throat> so I was to learn when fully engaged in battle mode, Bosch tended to be a bit dramatic. Right now, I asked. She stared down at me. The whole thing? Read it. It's only three verses long. I was perplexed. Still didn't get it. So I glared down. I glared down. I had no choice. I began. Flanders fields poppies blow, between the crosses row and row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks that bravely singing fly, scarce heard among the best below. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. He break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in flying steels. Wow, you sat there in silence. What a magnificent tribute. What an eloquent plea for the deaths on the battlefield. Not be deaths in vain. Let's learn later that this was a marvelous poem. It was written by Colonel John McRae. He was a Canadian physician. Uh, in the Second Battle of the Ypres Salient, 1914, the battle took a terrible toll on his unit. He just finished burying his closest friend and student, a man by the name of Lieutenant Alexis Helmar, and since there was no burial detail available, he dug the grave himself, and no chaplain available, he performed the ceremony. Agonizingly, he penned this little poem, and then, apparently unsatisfied with it, threw it away. Fortunately, it was retrieved by other soldiers on the battlefield taking the Punch magazine to publish it. It's now considered, perhaps, universally one of the most memorable war poems ever written. It takes just 30 seconds to read. But its message is internal, as relevant today as it was in 1914. So I sat there in awe. It suddenly dawned on me that Bosch is a man who I'd known since my elementary years, but as a man I really didn't know at all. Uh, I'd known him as a kindly old teacher, but he was not only clever in his folks, he was devious, more to the point, he was a fighter. It was a side of him I'd never known before. Why was I surprised? After all, this old socialist radical had magically survived through my entire academic career in the public school system of an arch conservative Republican community in the heart of the isolation of Scott Frusco. Community that revered and uh, adored Henry Thorpe, listened uh, intently to the radio ratings at one time, Father Charles Coughlin. I know this man? Surely there was a Machiavelli in there somewhere, a sphinx like figure standing over me. He was a formidable infighter. I was suddenly glad a little Bosch was on my side. You probably heard that I'm in charge of the Armistice State Assembly this year. Bosch was whispering even door was shut. In fact, I hadn't heard, but it was a rhetorical question. Your acceptance into Williams to study with Schumann or into Harvard to study with Carl Friedrich required a major sacrifice on my part, namely volunteering to take on this thankless task. Rest assured, it's the first and last time I'll ever do it. But now it's your duty, your time, time for you to fight back. This isn't just theory we've been talking about all these years. No, not just theory anymore. Now you will have to fight back and play your part to perfection. You ready? I, I nodded. It was rapidly dawning on me, and I was now to be cast in a 20th century passion play. Trap, <laughs> which Bosch not only would write, but one he would both direct and produce. I was slated to become the featured play. 
an ingenious scheme. Suddenly I could feel the Prussian Lancers, not, not, not the, the, real, the real black Uhlans this time, the Rhine, moving, stemming, uh, moving secretly in position on my flank. Where would the attack come from? How? It was not only exciting, it was terrifying. I was suddenly aware this was my future that was at stake here. Who was this man? Was I perhaps looking up from that chair at the ghost of Otto von Bismarck? <laughs> Was he Frederick the Great? Carnet? What was this man? Where was he going with this exotic scenario? It was not kept in suspense for very long. Here's the plan. I told you I'm a slow healer. Well, I've had all summer recuperating to think it out. I've written your college recommendation. If I must say so myself, it's damn good. It's <laughs> language now is changing. It's transforming into Mephistopheles right in front of my eyes. <laughs> Well, it goes to the very heart of what you are, what you aspire to, what unique skills and talents you can bring to a college or university. Frankly, I didn't know that I had any, any more than a coat of the core of my being. The pieces were set, solid, short. It's everything that Russell is not, except short, of course. Coach <laughs> was not a humble man. And mind you, I've overstated it. They do these things with recommendations of colleges expected, so don't let it go to your head. If all goes well, Russell will both sign it, override that congenital dunderhead in the guidance counselor's office on my recommendation, get now Russell's own together with her application to go off to Williams and Harvard. Now here's the plan. My heart is pounding. This poem is the reason Russell and his buddies will be out selling poppies instead of dandelions on November 11. Uh, he just doesn't realize it yet. Those are such a cynic. But he was singular unafraid, singularly unafraid, and focused, and he was right. The assembly will drone on as it usually does until 10.59 a.m. that point, you'll be standing alone at center stage, and you'll begin to recite in Flanders Fields. The lights will dim, and there will be one spotlight that will be shining directly on you. You must know the poem by heart. The spotlight will be too bright. You will not be able to see it. As you finish the last line, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. A single spot will shine on the clock as the clock strikes 11. Chimes will begin to ring 11 times, ever so quietly, as a distant bugle will now begin to sound echo taps. Not taps, mind you, echo taps. Not once, but twice. There'll be time to the split second. I will do that with my stopwatch. All goes according to plan. Uh, his royal banality, Russell, will be stunned. <laughs> Nothing like this has ever happened to him before in his banal life because no Dunkoff on his staff ever dreamed about breathing life into his crappy assembly before. <laughs> he follows the script. Russell returned to his office, flushed with emotion. There, lo and behold, will be the override of that moron together with your written recommendations to Williams and Harvard. All waiting for Russell's signature. He will not only sign them, he will bless them. I just hope to God he doesn't add any grammatically incorrect uh, <laughs> comments of his own. <laughs> Finally, God will be in his heaven and all will be right with the world. It was perhaps the coup de grace. Bosch, quoting one of the most conservative American political fa figures ever, Mark Hanna, puppet master of um, William McKinley, 1900, he informed his protege, William. McKinley by telegram that he'd been reelected as President of the United States with the words, God is in his heaven and all is right with the world. Stop. <laughs> of course, it all worked like clockwork. Right down to the chimes and the echo taps coming in on the second, the misguided guidance, guidance, guidance counselor was indeed overridden. My signed recommendation went off to Williams and Harvard on change schedule my application. And so it was that Alfred Bosch the rumpled old radical devotee of Red Fred Schumann, maneuvered my application, application against all odds, past the redneck Buford Russell. I've always imagined that Russell never did quite understand what had happened to him on that November 11th morning in 1947, before he went out to sell his poppies. But it was a morning he would no doubt fittingly cherish for the rest of his life. And I guess in retrospect, it was a good thing we did. After all, got me to college and changed my life. It's also something that Russell himself could and would take full credit for. For me, 
I'm still moved by that magnificent poem, November 11th. Still a special day for me. I always buy a little red poppy if I can. And Echo Taps, well, Echo Taps still sends shiver down my spine. So my passion play had a happy ending. Thanks to old motion, my life would be forever changed by the experience. There's the poster. I reluctantly had to forego the chance to study under Schumann <coughs> in order to enter the government department at Harvard. Ironically, in my sophomore year, I was assigned to study, possibly by law, I don't know why, as a 2T under the chairman of the government department, a man by the name of William, Professor William Gandell Elliott, perhaps the most conservative professor in the Harvard faculty. Uh, not only that, but Wild Bill, as he was affectionately taught, called by the, by the faculty, uh, turned out to be Professor Carl Friedrich's nemesis. They hated one another. I'm told they even almost came to blows, physical blows at one time. <laughs> Bosch would never know. I guess I was afraid to tell him at the time. As it turned out, thanks to Bosch, I was to have an exciting and stimulating intellectual journey through the Harvard uh, government department, albeit in many ways a somewhat more conservative one than Bosch would have hoped for. But they were years filled with stimulating dialogue, great debates with an exciting staff, so they're all political persuasions, years that I always cherish. I've often wondered whether they make teachers like old Bosch anymore, where I would be if it hadn't been for this lovable, bald-headed, cigar-chumping maverick. Always seems so out of place in that suburban Midwest education system, the one I was raised in. I realized he was a man who, true to his convictions, true to his teaching, would never succumb to fear. He had, after all, successfully fought for decades against a system that had undoubtedly tried to squelch his dissenting views. They had drilled into me just how critical such resistance could have been combating the rise of a nascent National Socialism. And I often think back in those days with him, not only for the views he imparted, but, and for his prescience, but for the Socratic way of extracting from my very impressionable young mind of the time, not facts, but a way of dissecting developments uh, in the world around me. Analogize, he would direct. See parallels. Political history must never be studied in a vacuum, otherwise it's worthless academic path. Following Bosch's directions, I would soon venture out on my own intellectually, and often my paths would lead me in markedly different directions than his own. As for Schumann, I remain to this day in awe of his riveting accounts of the origins and rise of Nazism, and by the timeliness and accuracy of his predictions, he was often far ahead of his time. I've read a great deal since Schumann uh, on how it was that a failed, amended psychopath found a path to deconstruct one of the most enlightened nations in Europe, uh, but to this day destroys democratic institutions, enslaves its people, and almost an entire continent. But in my judgment, to this day, no one has described or dissected that phenomenon better than Frederick L. Schumann. In this, I'm apparently not alone. I'm told that for decades, uh, his classes were standing room only for years in Williams College, not, not a hotbed of radicalism. But while at Harvard, I would eventually conclude that Schumann, Bosch's intellectual mentor, and an almost utopian longing had regrettably gone too far, at least from my way of thinking. At times it seemed to me that he blinded himself to some of the pitfalls of Marxism, the Soviet system, although he did indeed accurately predict, predict its eventual and modern time, the West, before he passed from the academic scene. And I concluded quite independently that Marx, Marx's mechanist image of man, the philosophical stump structure of his entire body of work, in fact, readily lent itself to being twisted, as indeed it was by a revolutionary such as Lenin an opportunistic mass murderer such as Joseph Stalin. And the rationalization for totalitarian state, one is fatal, equally brutal, and enslaving, as that Schumann described uh, in Hitler's fascist Germany. Bosch would never know these things about my subsequent thinking. <coughs> my brain recently recalled, why not? Well, I hadn't told him. I honestly didn't recall. That chopped it up, the immaturity. I may have foolishly been reluctant to tell Bosch. I deeply regret now uh, that I lost contact with him before I left the Midwest for good. I wish, I wish I had that time back. I imagine that many of you at one time or another 
harbored similar thoughts about someone important to you in your own past. To this day, I don't know what happened to old Bosch, except when I Googled him once, Googled him, I learned he died in 1968 at the age of 81. Find only that dry death statistic. A record, no obituary article, no memorial, no commentary, nothing. But upon reflection, I feel that Bosch, old socialist, Machiavellian war horse that he was, had he known where my intellectual search would eventually lead me, would have honored my independent thinking on such subject as Schumann and Marxism as they were arrived at critically without fear of dissent through the same dialectic process in which Bosch had mentored me. For that is the essence of the man. Thank you. I guess at this point we open it up to comments, thoughts, criticisms, throwing things, whatever you want. And uh, anybody got any thoughts? Anybody? Anybody have a mentor, something like Bo, somebody that that uh, affected your life, something like that? Yeah, you have to call. Question from Great Barrington, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Question from Great Barrington. Question from Great Barrington. Question from there, but I can't hear it. You speak up a little. Okay, I'll try. Do you Good. Hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. The question is that what you were speaking about is very frightening, at least for me. I don't know if anybody else feels the same way, because I see so many similarities beginning to happen here in the United States as the beginnings of Hitler. The one thing that you didn't mention, uh, and I don't remember, unfortunately, I was too young, where did the press fall into Hitler's rise? Did they have the same power? To, um, to change people's minds and influence people the way our press does today? Okay, to answer your question specifically, uh, Alfred Hugenberg was uh, the Rupert, Rupert Murdoch of his time. Uh, he was a press baron, controlled virtually all the press in Germany. When he switched over in the late 1920s, uh, after Hitler got out of, uh, out of Landsberg prison in 23, he began to, uh, to uh, try to uh, make up to the conservatives now, the industrialists like Tyson and Krupp. At that point, uh, uh, Hugenberg, Alfred Hugenberg gravitated to him. At that point, the press began to be more and more sympathetic uh, to, the, uh, to the Nazi cause, to the National Socialist cause. Hugenberg was <coughs> an interfactor in that. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, up to that point, the press had been far away from, from the National Socialists. There was just a fringe party. They were crazies. They were the wing nuts of their time, okay? Uh, but, uh, but with Hugenberg, now he had control of major press uh, in Germany, and uh, he really began to build up uh, uh, the Nazi party. Now, of course, Hitler, uh, when he took power uh, in 1933, uh, became fearful that Hugenberg was going to be another power source and threaten him. Uh, so he immediately ditched uh, Hugenberg. Uh, it was uh, uh, the kind of uh, thinking, quite frankly, that uh, uh, John Lukacs, uh, in a wonderful book called Five, Day, Five Days in London, referred to as uh, Hitler, uh, talking about some of the English uh, 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 appeasers as being minor Hugenberger, and he wasn't, uh, wasn't far from wrong there. Um, any, any questions here? Can I finish the, the question, please? Hello? Yeah, another question? Can, yeah. I finish, can I finish the question, please? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. Speak up. The rest of it is, you spoke about charismatic people. About who? Charismatic people. Charismatic people. And it seems to me that the same thing is happening here in the States again, in terms of charismatic people coming out from, from nowhere and beginning to rabble-rouse the public, and I'm wondering if you see that same... Well, the only thing fearful to me uh, to watch out for, and that we always have to be on guard against, is uh, that uh, threat of dissent. In other words, when people feel that they are threatened if they dissent, that's when things get, get, get uh, very, very uh, fearful to me. We had that in the McCarthy area. You've all lived through it. 
uh, and you remember an extraordinary period in our history when people were afraid to ascend. College professors were afraid to give lectures uh, on various subjects. Uh, people, film, film uh, makers couldn't speak out, uh, couldn't make the films they wanted. Uh, we had an enormous uh, problem with that uh, during the McCarthy era. That's what I'm fearful of. If I notice anything of that nature coming now, then I would be very, very concerned. That's something that Bosch brought to my attention made me very, very worried and concerned about. And uh, that's a lesson he taught me forever. Uh, that must be snuffed out whenever it begins to appear. Yes, ma'am? That would have to be addressed. It would have to be addressed by those in power. Uh, quite frankly, it should be addressed by the news media, our media. It should be addressed by those in power. And they should be very sensitive to it. They can advocate anything they want, any political position they want. But when the set is squelched, that's when they have to, that's when they have to come down. People have to be free, absolutely free, to express whatever it is they want to express. And the sense is a key part of that. Any other thoughts? Yes? In the 20s, with the rise of Hitler, yeah. was, was the body politic in Weimar Germany uh, do, as divided, for example, as our political uh, uh, setting is today? More so more so. It became more polarized. What began to happen was uh, you had essentially the <coughs> National Socialists, the fringes on the right, and the Communist fringes on the left, and then you had the Catholic Center Party in the middle, and von, Jürgen, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, von Hindenburg had a small party. Uh, and the fringes were at each other, and they were at each other physically. So no, we don't have that situation now. Uh, we have something of fringes uh, but nothing, nothing comparable to that at all. And again, let the fringes be what they may, but dissent must continue. That's the essence of what we are. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, next week. Oh, yes, sir. I'm very curious to uh, refresh my memory with your help as to how Lenin got on that train and was sent to Russia. Yeah, something about that just uh, the other day. You may have to repeat that. Uh, yeah, actually, pardon me? You may have to repeat the question. Oh, me. how Lenin got on the train and went to Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Right. Uh, Lenin attempted to contact uh, the leaders of Versailles, actually. The leaders eventually wound up at Versailles uh, to talk to them, but they would not talk to them. Our people <clears throat> over there would not talk to Lenin. Uh, he. Um, he actually made a phone call uh, to one of the United States representatives on Wilson's team. This is before her son, of course, uh, uh, in 1917. Uh, we don't know whether he would have made a furtive plea uh, for, uh, for something to happen, but it, they, they, weren't, they wouldn't listen to him. So he was, he was sealed within that train and taken to Russia, taken to uh, Moscow. And of course, we know what happened after that. So uh, how he got on the train, he was secreted in the train and sort of walked in. Uh, but he tried, reached out, tried to make uh, approaches. By the way, at Versailles, there were a lot of interesting people trying to reach out for those old men pouring over the maps. One was a busboy at a local hotel. We eventually changed his name to Ho Chi Minh. Yes? The, the, the seat with the train that took the what? Lenin to Russia was prior to the Nazis. This yes. was done by the German government trying to get the Russians to come out of the war. The hope was that revolution in Russia... And they succeeded. Exactly. And they that succeeded. The Russia did the got out of the war. Yeah, it, it got out of the war. And you had the battleship at Tepkin and all that. Yeah, they did drop out of the war. And uh, we, they thought at the time that would be the end of it because it would relieve the Germans. But in point of fact, uh, they then launched a very severe attack on the uh, Western Front shortly after that, and the attack failed. It was tremendous uh, uh, difficulty uh, for the Germans. They underwent enormous losses right after that, that the armistice took place. Uh, yes, ma'am. When did the Midwest, where you live, when did they shift their uh, sort of support of the Bund? And, and that's what they were. That, that I'm sure the majority didn't support yeah. it, but it was strong there. Yeah. When did they shift? December 7th, 1941. <laughs> 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 Th
It's all changed. Oh, up till then, then a tremendous, tremendous sympathy and empathy uh, in the Midwest, and lessening as, as time went on. And of course, all eyes were on uh, were on the Hitler, were on the you know the European uh, <coughs> sort of blind side uh, by Japan. I'll get into that in the uh, talk after the next after next week. The rise of uh, uh, the rise of Japan. Uh, the coming of World War in the Pacific, uh, but uh, that's when that happened. Yes, yes, ma'am. Well, what happened, you know, with Japanese after American Japanese after Pearl Harbor? Yeah, years. sure. Was there any thought from the government, American government, about the Germans' concern? Um, yeah, but not as much. Yeah, that was concerned about the Germans. Plenty of concern, but not as much so. And as a matter of fact, the Germans. Uh, were the largest single uh, factor in immigration in the, in the 19th century in this country. So the tremendous German population here, and yeah, they were they were uh, people were uh, were skeptical about them, uh, but <clears throat> they were never interned like the Japanese were. Yeah, there was a background on the Pacific to the, to the Japanese internment, uh, and uh, there had been a movement in the Pacific, quite frankly, to try to keep the Japanese out long before that period. In 1941, uh, that group simply took advantage of what was happening at that time uh, to overstate, and unfortunately, Roosevelt didn't react against it. One of his major mistakes there was. Yes, ma'am. Weren't there some captured German soldiers that were brought to the United States and put in in camps? Yes, there were. Were, were there German soldiers brought to the United States and yes. many, many came here, and a lot of them wanted to stay. After they finished, we were awfully good to them, as a matter of fact. But the answer is yes, there were many. Any of you ever have a, a, a teacher like I had here that changed your life? Raise your hand if you had a teacher that changed your life. Look at that. That's amazing. I would say three quarters of you had teachers like this to change your life. I thought maybe this would come home. Yes, we have one right now. <laughs> Judgment Gerber. It was brought out that the, what created this really was the fall of war. They blamed in that, they blamed the judges and the lawyers because they didn't oppose the war. Yeah. From that point on, anything was. Yeah. Uh, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was that uh, the rise of national socialism was really enabled legally by the judges and the lawyers. Uh, yeah, to some extent, but they were. They were overridden. Uh, they were powerless at certain points because once uh, he had taken over uh, uh, as chancellor in his coalition government, but suddenly uh, came the enabling decree, which did away with all human rights, all the Bill of Rights, temporarily. Uh, then suddenly Hitler used that as chancellor, uh, following the burning of the Reichstag, to charge into those courts and basically arrest all the judges and lawyers that were opposed to him most of the Jewish, and uh, that was the end of it. That was the end of the legal system in Germany. So at that point, total breakdown and separation of powers, which is the thing we have to always watch out for. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Now, I just want to go back to the question that the woman yes. started with yes. about she sees so many parallels to today. And I know you, you know, are focused on the fear of dissent, which I also agree with, but I wrote down a couple of other things that you said you said, tell the audience what it wants to hear. Yeah. Uh, youth symbols, yes. mass rallies, yeah. appeal to the low and middle class, and, and failure of conservatives to protest. And appeal and, to those people who felt they had no support system. Yes, that, I didn't write that down, but yeah, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it's um, clear that we ought to be scared of what's happening today. Well, we've got to look for, we've got watch for that. Yes. We've got to watch for that. I agree with that. But what I watch for, and what I think we all watch for in today's uh, holiday, as it were, uh, is the, uh, the attempt to suppress uh, dissenting views. Whenever anybody says, seems strict to express dissent, whatever it be, up her left, up her right, middle, whatever, that's that's when we're in trouble. We had that. Yes, yes. We had that incidentally under Nixon for a while. 
for the end. Water game. Yeah. In your memoir, can you share with us what it was like that first vacation when you returned home after your Harvard beginnings? That's usually a rite of passage in which you go home and there's nobody on the block that you can speak to. <laughs> so I have a lot of people I can speak to, but I will, t I will share a story with you, a very personal story that happened just at that time. I came home for the reading period. Now, I had gone off, uh, uh, my, my parents didn't go and they stayed back. Uh, and uh, I went all alone and came back for the first time. So two stories. This I think you'll get a kick out of. I came back on a train. My parents hadn't seen me since I left. And in Cleveland's Union Terminal, there's this vast uh, staircase that goes up. It sort of uh, goes way up and down below. Fred Harvey says, trains come in down below when you go up the staircase. I got on the train in Boston at night, about 7, 8 o'clock at night. It was scheduled to arrive in Cleveland around 6 in the morning. Young woman sat down next to me on the train, a little, little, little infant, just born, just born. Oh, we got chatting as you do over the night and, and uh, all night long. And, and she was going out to meet her husband who was out in Kansas or something. We stopped at Cleveland, but then going on out. Fine. We get back to the Cleveland uh, terminal station. We get out the train down below here. And she says, gee, I wonder, you know, I've got to carry this bag. She just hang on to this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, sure. So I take this. I start up. And then, halfway up, I see my parents. Larry Mouth! <laughs> Get up to the top of the stairs. Turns, takes the child, turns to my parents. Are you his parents? Yeah. You've got such a nice young couple. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Anyway, so that's, uh, that was my comment. That was my comment on present. Someday I'll tell you another story about it. Yes? Could you speculate on the impact of allowing the yeah. Central Catholic Party to sign the enabling? Enormous effect, unfortunate. Uh, unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. The reason they did it was they felt that it was uh, the Catholics were, should really concentrate not in the political arena, but in the educational arena, and with the workers' parties uh, to ameliorate uh, ameliorate the conditions of people uh, through Catholic workers groups and education influence the educational system. Uh, Hitler made a deal with them, basically. Fine, you do that. Keep them out of politics, and I will never persecute the Catholics. And that was the deal he made with the Vatican, and that resulted in the Concordat with the Vatican immediately after the situation. Of course, that, that leashed the Catholic Center Party to move over and, con and, and, and make up the two-thirds he needed for that enabling act. Of course, that was the end of democracy in Germany. That was it. But the reasons the Pope gave were those. He wanted Catholic workers' parties to work within workers' organizations to ameliorate conditions, and Catholics to work within the education system to ameliorate the education situation, to stay out of politics. Yes, sir? I forget the answer's name. I can't hear you. There was a book about uh, seven or eight years ago called Hitler's Pope. Yes, a book called Hitler's Pope. Yes, <laughs> went into that. You got basically the same thing from other day. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Go back to the question about what Midwestern yeah. anti German. Right. Anti German. Anti -German. I graduated from Appleton High School in Wisconsin in 1947. Right. Um, it was, I was surprised to learn that in World War I, it was, uh, it was such strong anti German sentiment. They stopped teaching German in the high schools. Mm -hmm. And Yes. People who had German names changed them. Yeah. Because of that strong. All that seemed to start after the Zimmerman telegram in the First World War. They uncovered a telegram that had been sent uh, uh, to Zim by Zimmerman, who was the German foreign minister, uh, to the German consul in uh, South America, basically in Mexico, trying to uh, entice the Mexicans into joining with the Germans 
The Germans said they were going to step up their U-boat campaign in the Atlantic before we were in. It was uncovered, covered by British intelligence, very cleverly uh, given to Wilson in a way that they didn't know that, he, that, that they had already broken our code. And after that, uh, American people saw that, and they were astounded. And there was a lot of resentment now began against the Germans. Because in that telegram, uh, Zimmerman had said, well, now, if you, if you go along with us, and you're allies with us, as we step up this U-boat campaign, we, or we need this, the other thing, we will give you uh, Texas, Nevada, and part of New Mexico. Now, that may have been not a bad idea. I don't know. But anyway, that's what the, that's what the, that's what the, that's what the Zimmerman telegram said. Following that, what you're describing began to take place. That sort of let off, that, that sort of let off this anti-German sentiment. We had tremendous German population in the United States. They had been the largest immigrant group in the 19th century. My there were, in fact, there were times when, when they, they proposed actually the German become a second language in Philadelphia. Um, yeah. My father emigrated from Holland to the United States in 1909. Uh -huh. He had been much in Wisconsin. He had to learn German instead of English. Oh, in Wisconsin. Yes, that was enormous. Uh, her father emigrated. I'm just repeating it for them because I don't think they can hear it. Fa uh, the woman's father emigrated from Holland in 1909. Actually, had to learn German in Wisconsin because it was a predominant language. Yes, sir. My mother had to learn German. Compulsory. Really? In Milwaukee. Yeah, in Milwaukee high schools had to learn German as well. In Milwaukee, one was very. Boyd was very active in the Milwaukee, I bet it was. Over anti-Semitism sure. prior to the yeah. Amazing how out in the open it was. And we really felt that in the Midwest. Those of you that were raised in Brooklyn didn't feel that. But those <laughs> <in the country. laughs> now let's see, let's see. That lady was first, and then you, and then you. Yes, yes, me. Let's speak up a little, because they, they have to hear you. Western born and raised in Detroit. Pardon me? With Father Cobbler. Yeah. With his ranting. You remember that? Very well. I you do? my own dad. Yeah. Talking about who this man was and the kind of things he was saying. I was very young. But yeah. I'm wondering, what was his influence? What was Father Cobb? Oh, enormous influence. I think, I think it was something like 30 or 40 million people <laughs> listened to him. He was so popular that in Boston, they would interrupt uh, the football games to broadcast and broadcast. And then they would continue the football games. He was enormously uh, popular throughout the United States. Yes, sir. There was a large home movement in uh, Yorkville, in New York City. Yes, there was in York. They not only had meetings in Madison Square Garden, and they had meetings in Yorkville. They had fights with uh, with uh, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, weapons. Why would that be concerned directly? This was after December 7th, 1941. It was still after. No. I don't know about after 741. Yeah. You've got me there. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was going to point out that much of the anti-German feeling was also in Great Britain. The uh, royal, uh, royal family changed from the House of Hanover to the House of Windsor. Yeah. My grandmother, who was born in Germany, German from the German father, uh, wouldn't admit to having been born in Germany when she applied yeah. for a passport. Yes, of course. There was that. There was that sentiment in England. But during the early and mid-30s, there was a tremendous amount of uh, feeling specific, uh, particularly among the British upper classes, that Hitler was something that would protect them against the communist force from the East. And they lost an enormous opportunity at that time uh, to, uh, to stuff him out when he could have been stuck out. Uh, any other? We seem to have a lot of questions now. Coming on. That's good. Okay, next week we're going to turn to baseball. Thank you. Uh, next week, we're going to turn to a totally different subject. Uh, we're going to deal, however, with the impact of radio uh, on my life, on our lives, the lives of the country. We're going to deal with the impact of radio and baseball in particular on the psyche of cities. And I'm going to focus on Brooklyn and, and in New York, yay, yay, and Cleveland and Ohio, about as two as, as diametrically opposed cities as you possibly want in the continent, but had a lot in common. In, and the radio itself had an enormous effect. So look forward to seeing you next.